so, so the topic of today's talk, of course, is vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and here is a definition of vaccine hesitancy. So this is from Maya Goldenberg's recent book. So vaccine hesitancy refers to an attitude of ambivalence regarding vaccines. It is distinct from vaccine refusal, which is a behavior. Vaccine hesitancy runs, runs along a spectrum from mild to severe uncertainty about whether vaccines are safe, effective, and necessary. And while attitudes and behaviors are linked, vaccine hesitancy does not fully determine vaccine acceptance or refusal. So I think this will do for our purposes. So the, the two key points here are, number one, um, she understands hesitancy as running along a spectrum, so, so it's mild to severe. Uh, and the other key point from here is that she's distinguishing between hesitancy, which she takes to be an attitude, uh, and refusal, which she takes to be a behavior, right? So that's vaccine hesitancy. I mean, there's something a bit odd about describing someone who is deeply skeptical about vaccines and indeed believes that they are unsafe. It's a bit odd to call them vaccine hesitant, but, but never mind about that. Maybe that's just a, a sort of ordinary language um, peculiarity. Okay, so um, when we're confronted by something like vaccine hesitancy, which I guess most people take to be problematic in the current environment, uh, what we try to do is to explain the phenomenon of vaccine hesitancy with a view to, def to, to devising an effective response in the form of, uh, of, of, of policies or advice. So what I want to do in this talk is to contrast two kinds of explanations of vaccine hesitancy. Okay, so one kind of explanation of hesitancy is what I call a non-rational outsider explanation, non-rational outsider, NRO explanations. And I want to contrast those with what I call rational insider explanations. Okay, so I want to really make the case for rational insider explanations of vaccine hesitancy. I think we're all familiar with non-rational outsider explanations. You won't be familiar with that label because that's my label, but you'll all be familiar with that style of explanation. And, and, and what I want to make the case for is this alternative style of explanation, rational insider explanations. So to get a handle on what I have in mind here, uh, we need to, uh, get a handle on two contrasts. So first of all, there's a contrast between rational and non-rational explanations. It's one to the fundamental contrast in the philosophy of action. And we need to get a handle on the contrast between insider and outsider explanations. Okay, so once we've got those two contrasts in place, we can then put them together in different combinations and arrive at the two combinations that I'm interested in. Okay, so let's uh, start off with, um, uh, so this slide is just essentially just a list of obvious questions, right, which is, what do I mean by a rational insider explanation? Why do we need them? Okay, so let's start off with the rational, non-rational contrast. So for those of you who've done any philosophy of action, this will be very familiar to you. Uh, I'm, I'm drawing here on um, the work of a philosopher of action called Jonathan Dancy. But what Dancy says here is, is kind of pretty standard, right? So there's nothing, there's nothing untoward here, I think. So let's th start off with an example. Supposing that Hamid's yawning causes Rosie to yawn. Now that is a non-rational explanation of Rosie's yawning. Because if you ask, well, why did Rosie yawn? A perfectly reasonable answer might be because Hamid yawned. And this is something that is a familiar enough uh, phenomenon. Now, what's interesting about this is that this does not, although it does explain Rosie's yawning, it doesn't explain her yawning by specifying her reasons for yawning. So it's, it's, it's a non-rational explanation in the sense that it's not an explanation by reference to Rosie's reasons for yawning. Right? So the thought is that you certainly have a causal explanation here, Hamid's yawning caused her to yawn, but not a rational explanation. So uh, Hamid's yawning 
uh, does not constitute the reason in the light of which she yawned. So another way of putting this would be to say that in this case, her yawning does not express Rosie's rational agency and is not in, as philosophers like to say, the logical space of reasons. Now, this is not, of course, to say that Rosie's yawning is irrational. It's neither rational or irrational. It's just something that happens that has an identifiable cause, namely the fact that her partner Hamid yawned. Now, yawning is a kind of slightly odd, odd, odd example because it's not clear that we want to say that yawning in this sort of scenario is a full-blown action, certainly a full-blown intentional action. In the case of um, intentional actions, uh, there normally is... Um, and here I'm going to quote Dancy, some consideration in the light of which the agent acted. And so this is the Dancy quote, when someone does something, there will normally be some consideration in the light of which she acted, the reasons for which she acted. I mean, there are odd, maybe some odd, odd cases that don't fit that, Pattern, but this is the kind of core of the notion of an intentional action. And a rational explanation of an action will be an explanation by specifying the reasons for which the agent acted. That's a rational explanation. So a rational explanation is one that explains why the agent acted by giving you the reasons why the agent acted. And by doing that, you make the action rationally intelligible. Now, I'm not saying here that a person's reasons for acting in a certain way are necessarily good reasons. I'm not saying that. Reasons can be good or they can be bad, but still be reasons. So if you were a Remainer, you might think that the reasons for which lots of people voted for Brexit were very bad reasons, but nevertheless, they were... They, they were the reasons for which they voted for Brexit, for better or worse. Okay, so in, in the philosophical jargon, these sorts of reasons, good or bad, are, are sometimes called motivating reasons, that's Dancy's locution, and another uh, piece of jargon that people sometimes use is they talk about agential reasons. Okay, and you have something quite similar in the case of belief. So, but for lots of our ordinary empirical beliefs, there is a reason why we have those beliefs. And so why do I believe, why do I believe that there's a computer screen in front of me? Because I can see that there's a computer screen in front of me, right? So that's my reason for believing. Uh, and philosopher J.L. Austin pointed out that when somebody expresses their belief, a question to which they are liable is, why do you think that? And that is usually understood as a request for the person's reasons. Okay, so I hope, I hope that I've, I've explained the contrast between rational and non-rational explanations. Okay, let's move on to insider versus outsider explanations. Okay, so outsider explanations explain an action or belief from an external point of view, a point of view that's external to the agent without engaging with the agent's subjectivity or seeing things from the agent's own point of view. That's what I mean by an outsider explanation. Insider explanations attempt to explain an action or belief from the point of view of the agent. But these are explanations that try to engage with the agent's own subjectivity. Right now, one of the, my main research interest currently actually is not uh, vaccine hesitancy. My main research interest at the moment is actually the philosophy of terrorism. Now, in accounts of terrorism, one of the big questions that people ask is, why do people become terrorists? Right? Now, lots of answers have been proposed to that. So people say, well, they become terrorists because of lack of education or political marginalization uh, or um, the influence of, the influence of uh, people who radicalize them. Now, the point about all those explanations is that they're all what I'm calling outsider explanations, right? They aren't attempts to explain 
the turn to political violence from the standpoint of the violent agent. That's what I mean by an outsider explanation. An insider explanation is an explanation that tries to, as it were, see things from the agent's own point of view, tries to engage with the agent's own subjectivity. Now, of course, insider explanations are extremely important to us. We, we resort to insider explanations you know, all the time in our interactions with one another. Now, think about biographers. Very often, biographers spend quite a lot of their time trying to come up with insider explanations for the actions of their subject. Right? They're, trying to, they're trying to engage with the subjectivity of the people they're writing about. That's what a good biographer does. Okay, so that's the insider-outsider contrast. And, and when I'm talking about insider explanations, I'm talking about something that is related to the notion of Verstehen. Okay, so Verstehen means something like understanding or comprehension. And there's an entire tradition in the social sciences, uh, which is the Verstehen or Verstehenist tradition. So this is, the, this is the idea that social phenomena have to be understood from within, from the point of view of the social agent. And Verstehen is a method for achieving this type of understanding. And if you have something very similar in, in history, right? So you have philosophers of history like R.G. Collingwood, who think that, well, what you try to do in, uh, in historical explanation. So if you're faced with the question, why did Caesar cross the Rubicon? What, what you're trying to do is to, as it were, get into Caesar's point of view and understand why from his point of view, crossing the Rubicon seemed like a good thing to do. Okay. Uh, So how does Verstehen work? Now, this is a kind of very controversial area. There are lots of different understanding, understandings of Verstehen. Uh, but here's a quotation from a guy called Michael Martin um, in a book on Verstehen, where he says, in its strongest forms, Verstehen entails reliving the experience of the actor, or at least rethinking the actor's thoughts, while in its weakest forms, it only involves reconstructing the actor's rationale for acting. Okay, so it, 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 in, in a kind of minimal sense, Verstehen involves reconstructing the actor's rationale, the reasons for which they acted. And then there are more demanding conceptions of, of um, Verstehen in which, you, in which you somehow try to relive the experiences of the agent as they, as they act. And the point of Verstehen in this, in this particular tradition of explanation is, is, is it gives us, it gives you a, um, a rational insider explanation, right? So, it's, it, so insofar as you uh, are able to reconstruct the, the agent's rationale for acting, insofar as you're able to relive their experiences and as it were rethink their thoughts insofar as you are able to do all of those things you are really in the business of trying to achieve a rational insider explanation of why they do what they do okay now so with all that sort of abstract philosophizing in the background, I now want to get round to the topic of vaccine refusal. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with refusal and then move on to hesitancy. So refusal is the behavior, the action, if you like, of refusing vaccines that have been recommended uh, by uh, um, the government and or um, medical science. So here are some things that are often said about vaccine refusal. So one very common claim is that vaccine refusal is explained by low levels of scientific literacy. Another hypothesis is that vaccine refusal is explained by misinformation, particularly online misinformation. 
Then there's the claim that vaccine refusal is explained by the so-called death of expertise. So as, as some of you may know, there's a book by a guy called Tom Nichols called The Death of Expertise, where, where he doesn't think expertise is really dead, but what he, what he thinks is that, is that there's increasing skepticism about expertise, that we've seen the growth of anti-expertism. Uh, and, and this is supposed to be why you have the phenomenon of vaccine refusal. Then yet another hypothesis is that vaccine refusal is explained by economic and or political marginalization. And, and then there's yet another explanation which says that vaccine refusal is explained by poor education or by the intellectual vices of refusers. So it's explained by the fact that vaccine refusers are gullible, for example, or dogmatic, or somehow epistemically vicious. Okay, now what I want to suggest to you is that most, if not all of these, are non-rational outsider explanations. Okay, so let's take the, let's take the first explanation. So first of all, this is not an explanation that specifies reasons. Right? Having a low level of scientific literacy is not a reason for refusing vaccines. It's a cause, perhaps, but it's not a reason. Misinformation, being misinformed, is not a reason for refusing vaccines. So, so, so that, that's what I mean when I say that, that what we're dealing with here are causal rather than rational explanations. Furthermore, with the possible exception of the stuff about intellectual vices, but certainly with respect to the others, these are all outsider explanations, right? Essentially, these are explanations in which you're looking at refusers from an external, as it were, scientific standpoint. Right? You're thinking of them as, as it were, uh, objects of study, objects of investigation, and you're trying to work out why they do this weird thing, which is refusing vaccines. And you try to explain that by reference to these, um, roughly speaking, socio-structural factors. Okay, so that's why I want to call these uh, explanations non-rational outsider explanations, or NRO explanations. Okay, so, so here, are, here is a question and here are some uh, observations. Okay, so one question, of course, is whether these explanations are actually convincing, even on their own terms. Okay, so, so that, I mean, that's a kind of complicated question, right? So these are, these are hypotheses about um, uh, vaccine hesitancy and some are more plausible than others. So if you uh, think about, um, uh, low levels of scientific literacy. Uh, there are cases that support that, then there are cases that don't support that, right? So, so there are, I mean, there are all sorts of um, uh, questions that might be asked just about the adequacy of these explanations, even on their own terms, right? So if you th think of the case of um, parents refusing to give their children the MMR vaccine, uh, Certainly in that case, there wasn't a lot of evidence that these parents were poorly educated. In fact, quite the contrary. Okay, so, so, that, so there, is a, there is a genuine question here about whether these explanations are adequate even, even on their own terms. Well, I don't wanna get into that, but right? I mean, I think they're interesting questions, but I'm not gonna address those questions. The point I want to emphasize, which I hope is now kind of completely obvious, is that none of these explanations attempts to specify the vaccine refuses reasons for refusing to vaccinate. And so that's the point I made a few minutes ago. None of these explanations are explanations by reference to reasons. And by the same token, they do not represent vaccine refusal as an expression of the person's own rational agents. Right? And this is particularly clear, I think, with the second explanation. Okay, so, so one way that people sometimes talk about uh, vaccine um, refusal 
is to represent refusers, refuseniks, as you might call them, as the victims, as, as it were, the passive victims of online misinformation or disinformation. Okay, now when you think of them or represent them in that way, you're not taking seriously the idea that their refusal might be a genuine expression of their own agency. Okay, so that's that that's just a kind of gloss on the um, on on the the idea that these are non-rational explanations. Now, of course, one thing that you might say in response to this is, look, if you want, if you want a rational explanation for vaccine refusal, well, the rational explanation is vaccine hesitancy. Right? So if someone is vaccine hesitant, if they are ambivalent or skeptical about the, the, the necessity or safety of vaccines, then that really would be a reason for refusing to have vaccines. Maybe it's not a good reason, but it certainly looks like a reason. Okay, and I, that seems right. I mean, that seems right. Okay, but all it does is to push the problem a stage further back, which is, well, now we have the same cluster of questions about vaccine hesitancy. How do we explain that? And again, you have the same choices. Should, should we be looking for an outsider or an insider explanation? Uh, should we be looking to explain hesitancy in terms of reasons or in terms of um, causal factors that are not themselves reasons? Okay, so being strongly vaccine hesitant, I want to say, is a reason for refusing to vaccinate. But we then face the challenge, if we say that, we then face the challenge of making vaccine hesitancy rationally intelligible. Now, this challenge has, in fact, been taken up by a number of authors uh, who are listed here, Melissa Leith, Leach and James Fairhead, uh, Jennifer Reich and Maya Goldenberg, have all in their own way responded to this challenge. OK, so the first thing to say is that you can't talk about vaccine hesitancy in an undifferentiated form. Right? There are cases and there are cases. It depends on which vaccine are you talking about, what, which episode of vaccine hesitancy are you talking about? Okay, now all of these authors, Leach and Fairhead, Reich and Goldenberg, are particularly concerned with vaccine hesitancy in relation to the MMR triple vaccine. Okay, so um, they all try to explain MMR vaccine hesitancy uh, using the techniques of anthropology effectively. They have a kind of ethnographic approach to vaccine hesitancy. And what all of these authors try to do in their own ways is to essentially come up with rational insider explanations of vaccine hesitancy. They're all in the business of trying to engage with the subjectivity of vaccine hesitant parents. That's what they're trying to do, to engage with their subjectivity, to, to kind of see things from their point of view, to get into their heads. Um, um, and they're trying to um, find, to locate, to specify reasons for this particular form of vac vaccine hesitancy. Um, so for those of you who haven't read this work, I, I highly recommend it. It's extremely interesting. Um, the Leach and Fairhead book is called Vaccine and Anxiety, which was published in 2007. Um, and the Jennifer Reich book is called Calling the Shots 2016, also very, very good. And the, and the Goldenberg book has just come out and it's called Vaccine Hesitancy. So they're all, they're all really, really excellent. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of try and summarize some of the main findings of these, uh, of these authors. Okay, so here's one finding. And just in case you're not familiar with this, right? There was a there was a there was a phase uh, in 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 the sort of late 1980s, early 1990s, when uh, parents were being urged to give their children the MMR triple vaccine. Around that time, Andrew Wakefield published a notorious paper in the Lancet, hypothesizing a link 
between the MMR triple vaccine and child with autism. Right? Now this paper was uh, discredited uh, and was subsequently retracted, but nevertheless, uh, there was a huge upsurge in uh, vaccine hesitancy following on from Wakefield's article. Like Wakefield was eventually struck off the medical register in the UK. He lost his medical license. He emigrated to the United States, where he is now a leading light in the, um, in the anti-vaxxer movement. Okay, so, this is, so that's the background, uh, just in case you, uh, you aren't aware of it. There is no, there is no link that anyone has established between the MMR vaccine and childhood autism. Okay, so one finding of this research is that many MMR vaccine hesitant parents were affluent, well-educated, and prepared to follow government advice on other matters. So they followed government advice on uh, smoking, on drinking, on diet. So, so, you could, so you can't say, in other words, you can't say the reason these people were vaccine hesitant is that they were just suspicious of what the government or doctors were telling them, but they weren't in general. Um, the, um, uh, the Reich study found that um, most vaccine, most mothers in these scenarios um, uh, had, were college educated and were from families with a family income of $75,000 and above in the 1990s and 2000s. I imagine to respect a respectable amount of money. Second um, observation. So this is a quotation from Bleach and Fair. The encouragement to research or look into it and then make up your mind is a pervasive theme in MMR talk and in parents' narratives about the process of deciding. Right? So this is a really fundamental point. The thing that parents kept on saying to Leach and Fairhead is that what they thought was that every parent needed to make up his or her own mind. Um, there was actually very little evidence of parents putting pressure on other parents either to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. Instead, the whole narrative, the whole rhetoric was, you need to make up your own mind, you need to do your own research. And, and uh, what they were appealing to was, you know, I mean, it, in a way that the sort of, you know, Kantian enlightenment ideal of thinking for yourself. A further very interesting um, result of this research is that many MMR hesitant parents have and had what I am going to call a particularist view of child health. So a particularist view basically says that I'm not going to think of my child just as an instance of a general type. Right? So I'm not going to think of my seven-year-old simply as a seven-year-old right? among hundreds of thousands of other seven-year-olds. Right? I think of my child as my child with his or her own particular vulnerabilities, his or her own particular family history. So many vaccine hesitant parents who did not vaccinate their children didn't vaccinate their children because they thought that there were specific factors that made their child um, vulnerable to adverse side effects from vaccination. So I'm not saying that they were right. I'm just saying that's how they thought. Okay, so here's a quotation from Leach and Fairhead. Particularist thinking characterizes the ways that many parents now think about vaccination, evaluating effects of vaccination on their own child in relation to his or her particular strengths or vulnerabilities. They want to know if vaccines are safe for their kids. They're not interested in um, population level studies about the safety of vaccines. They're particularly interested, what they want to know is, is this going to harm my child? Another very interesting feature of this was that, was that um, vaccine hesitancy 
of this form was tied, appeared to be tied with the growth of the so-called expert parent model. Right, so, so the point of the expert parent model was something like this, that parents were increasingly being encouraged to think of themselves as experts when it came to their own children. Right? So the sort of thing that people would say to parents is, you know, you know best. When it comes to your own child, like what time should they go to bed? What time should they eat? Um, uh, there's no one in a better position to know the answers to those questions than the parent. Okay, so here's a quotation from Rice's book. In an expanding number of spheres, parents generally and mothers specifically are expected to be parents, uh, experts on their own children. Okay, so here are some um, implications of this. So one implication of this story is that vaccine hesitant parents certainly have reasons for their hesitancy. Right? They aren't passive victims of manipulation by outside forces. Right? Again, the issue is not whether their reasons are good reasons. The issue is whether they have or had reasons whether their hesitancy was rationally intelligible in the light of other things that they believed and um, thought were important. So this ethnographic research doesn't particularly support NRO explanations of vaccine hesitancy. It does support, indeed, it const they constitute a kind of um, a rational insider explanation. Furthermore, most, MMR hesitant parents were not anti-vaxxers, right? So now this uh, anti-vaxxerism is now, you know, a big, a big deal all over the world and particularly in the States, I guess. Uh, but they point out, the researchers point out that, um, they were, that the parents in this case were not opposed to vaccinations per se. Many parents who did not consent to the MMR vaccine for their children did consent to other vaccines. Uh, an interesting case is the tetanus vaccine where the vast majority of parents consented to the tetanus vaccine because they, because they saw the tetanus vaccine as protecting their children against uh, a harm that their children might encounter. So this might happen, they might actually um, get tetanus if they were not vaccinated. Uh, the next thing to point out is that most parents, so this is a quotation from Reich, which I think is actually going to be very important for my argument, so I'll highlight this. Uh, according to Reich, most parents, and she's, remember she's talking specifically here about MMR vaccine hesitant parents in the, in the sort of early 2000s, most parents of, uh, who oppose vaccines are not part of a, of a political movement. Those who reject expert advice on, on vaccines are not necessarily conservative or liberal, and have a wide array of political affiliations and views of the state. Also, a lot of people talk about the breakdown of trust. Uh, and, and again, there wasn't a lot of evidence that trust was really the issue here. Uh, trust was the issue with some vaccine hesitant parents, but there were lots of vaccine hesitant parents. Where, you know, it wasn't a question about whether they trusted the government or trusted the medical establishment. It was more a matter of them conceiving of themselves as simply making up their own minds for their own children, knowing what they knew about their children. Um, so one thing that, I mean, this is sort of going beyond what uh, Leach and Fairhead and these other people say, but I think in the spirit of what they say, um, it, is that it, it's actually not right to think of a lot of these vaccine hesitant parents as tricked or manipulated um, into being vaccine hesitant. They're not, they were not by and large passive victims of misinformation. By and large, the, 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 the picture that these researchers paint is of active epistemic agents making up their own minds about whether to vaccinate or not. Now, they might indeed have made the wrong decision. It was, a, you know, a, a mistake for them not to vaccinate their children. 
But nevertheless, they were, they were active epistemic agents. And their decision was an expression, for better or worse, an expression of their rational agency. And insofar as these parents are represented as passive victims of manipulation or propaganda or misinformation, you might even think of that as a form of epistemic injustice in something like Miranda Fricker's sense. Right? So, so, so when Fricker talks about epistemic injustice, um, well, she means kind of different things uh, by, by epistemic injustice, but one notion of epistemic injustice that is, uh, that is relevant here is the idea that um, you are treating uh, full epistemic subjects as less than full epistemic subjects. That's a form of epistemic injustice. Right? So if, if you are a full epistemic subject with full rational agency, but I represent you as a passive victim of manipulation or propaganda, then I'm being epistemically unjust to you. I'm treating you as a less than full epistemic agent. Okay, so, so one kind of implication of what I've been saying so far is that at least some NRO explanations of vaccine hesitancy, particularly the ones that emphasize misinformation, um, are potentially guilty of treating these parents as in, in a way that's epistemically unjust. Okay, now, when I talk about MMR vaccine hesitancy, that's what I mean by old vaccine hesitancy. Okay, so when I talk about old, I'm talking about that particular form of vaccine hesitancy, which prior to COVID was the most um, widely discussed form of vaccine hesitancy. Now, of course, COVID has, has uh, changed the parameters, right? Because now, now we have vaccine hesitancy in relation to the uh, COVID vaccine, and that is what I'm calling new vaccine hesitancy. I want to call it new vaccine hesitancy because I think it is different in some crucial respects from old vaccine hesitancy. Okay, so um, that's what I'm now interested in. Now, there are some elements of old vaccine hesitancy that are detectable even in new vaccine hesitancy, right? So it's not a, it's not a completely clear and sharp distinction. However, I mean, another obvious difference is that, of course, in the case of COVID, at least in a lot of cases, people are wondering whether they should vaccinate themselves. This isn't just about an issue about vaccinating their children. And a kind of key point is that this new vaccine hesitancy is not particular. It's not about your own vulnerabilities or the vulnerabilities of your children as particulars. This is much more grounded in the idea that these vaccines are generally unsafe or unnecessary. Okay, so there isn't the particularist motivation here that you have in the case of MMR. But the point I really want to emphasize is this, is the third bullet point on this slide, that this new vaccine hesitancy is more political than old vaccine hesitancy. And many opponents of the COVID-19 vaccine are part of a political movement with a clear political agenda. Now, if you go back to the Jennifer Reich thing about MMR, right, remember that Reich's uh, um, um, discovery was that at least in the case of the MMR vaccine, politics wasn't at the forefront. You couldn't particularly say that the people who were parents who were resistant to the MMR vaccine for their kids, that they were more likely to be Republicans or Democrats. There wasn't really any evidence of that. Um, they weren't. It wasn't a political. It wasn't a particularly political thing. Whereas COVID nineteen vaccine hesitancy is, I want to suggest, very much um, a political phenomenon, and that's a kind of key distinction between these two things. So, what do I mean when I talk about the ideological or political agenda? of these new anti-vaxxers. What, what agenda is this? Well, so first of all, I think you have close links to right-wing and perhaps also left-wing 
anti-elitist populism, as evidenced by high levels of vaccine refusal and hesitancy among Trump Republicans in the US. Right? So it's not the case any longer that you can't draw any conclusions about someone's politics from whether they're vaccine refusers or not. Like, you, it's certainly in the American context, you can. Right? So one thing you can conclude uh, if, if you know that someone is, is a vaccine refuser, they're more likely to be Republicans than they are to be Democrats. There are also close links between COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy and libertarian anti-state ideology. So, 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 so now vaccine hesitancy and refusal have become bound up with, the, uh, with, with, with libertarian ideologies, with the idea that, um, it's, that the state should not be telling me what to do, that it's an, interfer it, it's an infringement of my liberties to be told to mask up or to be told to um, vaccinate. I think there are also close links between COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy and other forms of denialism, particularly climate change denialism, right? So, so COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy is not just a kind of isolated phenomenon. Right? People who are COVID-19 vaccine hesitant tend also to be, to have views about a whole range of other matters, right? including climate change. And, if any, and, and here's a kind of nice quotation. So in the UK, there's a website called Stop the New Normal, right? So this is an anti-vaxxer anti website in the UK, which appears to be, be run by or in, on behalf of uh, someone called Piers Corbyn, uh, the brother of uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Okay, so here's a kind of quotation from this website, um, from Corbyn. The whole, the so-called man-made climate hysterical scare is a con which like COVID-19 hysteria is not to control climate or a virus but to control you and smash the economy to make way for the new world order. Classic conspiracist trope here. I mean as soon as someone starts talking about the new world order watch out. Uh, um, and, and, and of course, I mean, it, these conspiracy theories, theories about the new world order are tied up with a whole lot of other conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories about 5G, so you had have, you have COVID anti-vaxxers leading the very same people burning down 5G masks uh, because they think that, this, that these 5G masks are uh, uh, being used for nefarious purposes by the New World Order. And uh, Stand Up X is another one of these uh, websites. If you haven't looked at them, you should really look at these. They're really interesting. I mean, they are very, very interesting. Okay, so, so, so what I'm trying to say, the point I'm trying to make here is that when you look at COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy, what you are dealing with here is a political phenomenon or a phenomenon that is close that is closely tied to a broader a wider political agenda um, it's not just something that exists in splendid isolation okay so I now want to talk a little bit about conspiracy theories because it seems to me that actually one way to put what I've been saying is that COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy is very much tied to conspiracy theories in a way that MMR vaccine hesitancy was not. I mean, of course, I realize that people who are MMR vaccine may well have had rather negative views about big pharma, right? I, of course, I understand that. Okay, but, but, but now you have something that goes way, way, way beyond that. Now we're talking not just about, you know, skepticism about big pharma, but we're talking about, um, a commitment to kind of global conspiracy theories um, of the sort that um, people like Piers Corbyn are promoting in the UK and of, of, of a kind that, you know, any number of people are promoting in the US today. So, so I just want to make a couple of observations about conspiracy theories. And, and I want to make these observations because I think they have a bearing on 
on, on, on policy responses, right, to COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. Okay, so the first thing I want to say about conspiracy theories is that you cannot refute a conspiracy theory on its own terms. I mean, conspiracy theories are designed not to be refutable. Right? So the things that refute normal theories don't refute conspiracy theories, right? So contrary evidence is not seen by conspiracy theories as evidence against their theories. Contrary evidence is seen as evidence in favor of their theories, right? Because of course, the conspirators would have planted contrary evidence. The absence of evidence is not seen as a problem for their theories, because of course, well, what would you expect, right? From an effective conspiracy, you would expect the conspirators not to leave behind traces of their conspiracies. That's why you need geniuses like conspiracy theorists, right? In their mom's basement, right? Looking at, you know, footage of 9-11 frame by frame to detect what the conspiracy was in that case. So there's a nice uh, quotation here from Brian Keeley uh, in a paper of his called Of Conspiracy Theories, uh, in which he says that conspiracy theories are the only theories for which evidence against them is construed as evidence in favor of them. Okay, the other thing I want to say about conspiracy theories, so this is a line that I take in my book on conspiracy theories, which came out a couple of years ago. So the thesis of my book is that conspiracy theories, in the particular sense in which I understand them, are first and foremost, forms of political propaganda. They are political gambits whose real function is to promote a political agenda. They're not just theories like any other. That's absolutely fundamental to understanding what conspiracy theories are today. Okay, so if you think of the most notorious conspiracy theory of all, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, but that's not just a theory. That's a piece of anti-Semitic racist propaganda. That's what the protocols are. And to say, well, you know, it's just a theory. We have to, we have to just look at this in the, using the usual methods of theory, you know, theory validation. Like if you think of the protocols in that way, you have gone very seriously wrong. Okay, now, of course, conspiracy theories in this sort of capital C, capital T form that I'm talking about, have a lot to say about science and about scientific expertise. Okay, and this is going to turn out to be really quite important for understanding policy uh, implications. Um, so here, here are two things that I've got, two quotations which I think are very good from a guy called Jovan Byford, very good book on conspiracy theories, the second best book on conspiracy theories. Um, so, Byford says, the whole of biomedical science and public health enterprise is perceived as nothing less than the product of a vast conspiracy involving scientists, researchers, medical doctors, and public health officials, right? That's part of the whole conspiracy's shtick, right? That, that, that when you talk about science, so-called, you're talking about essentially a big conspiracy with, with you know, polit corrupt politicians, uh, scientists, doctors, big pharma, they're all in it together. Uh, and another element of this sort of anti-science um, perspective of the conspiracy mentality is that conspiracy theorists are inherently skeptical towards conventional methods of knowledge production. So they are skeptical about things like peer reviewed journals, judicial investigations, university departments, or scientific institutions. Now, just as, yeah, okay. So, so just as a matter of empirical fact, this seems to me to be a, an accurate description of what we are dealing with here. So uh, I talked earlier about a distinction between rational insider explanations and uh, non-rational outsider explanations. And of course, you know, we face the same problem now when thinking about conspiracy theories and these broader ideologies that um, conspiracy theories are a part of. Once again, uh, in these cases, we have the choice between NRO explanations and RI explanations. Uh, and, and in the case of RI explanations, I think, again, here, as with a vaccine hesitancy, we need to focus on the broader worldview and ideological affiliations of conspiracy theorists if we want to make sense of what they do and what they think 
from the inside if we're serious about engaging with their subjectivity. Okay, so here, here I think are some policy implications of what I've been saying. So this is the last slide. Okay, so for, first implication, to the extent that vaccine hesitancy, new vaccine hesitancy, right? To the extent that vaccine hesitancy and refusal are underpinned by conspiracy theorizing as they are, they cannot be rebutted simply by giving the, the, the refusers the facts or the evidence. That is not gonna work. With, with these people. And it's not going to work because they are going to see the evidence and those supplying it as painted. So this is just not going to work. So the whole idea that you just not give them the facts and this everything will be fine, it's not going to work. It hasn't worked and it won't work. And the deeper point here is that vaccine conspiracy theories, like conspiracy theories generally, can't be refuted on their own terms. The only way to tackle them, I think, is to tackle the ideologies with which they are closely associated and which they try to promote. And of course, that is not a job for scientists. Right? That is not a job for virologists. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is really a, a political issue and a political battle, right? So what I want to say is that vaccine hesitancy actually can only really realistically be dealt with at that level. That's the only way you're going to be able to deal with this. And the reason that it's so hard in the world today is that what we are seeing in many different countries is the rise of anti-so-called anti anti-elitist populist ideologies, the very ideologies that promote conspiracy theories, that promote vaccine hesitancy and promote vaccine refusal. So we are in a uniquely unpromising political climate for actually responding effectively today to um, vaccine refusal and vaccine hesitancy that is motivated by these um, populist um, ideologies. And uh, I think the problem for uh, at least a number of governments today is that, is that in Europe and in, in North America, governments themselves have promoted these ideologies. So, you, you know, you had Trump promoting promoting these conspiracy theories. But of course, in, in, that, in, that, in that case, these governments are in a particularly bad position to then combat these theories, which they have been instrumental in promoting. So governments that promote these ideologies, the ideologies that are the ideologies of vaccine, of new vaccine refusal and new vaccine hesitancy, these governments have no right to complain about their consequences. So I think the take, the take home message I have is a kind of deeply pessimistic message. Right? I mean, we're living in a world where everything is turning to shit, politically speaking, <laughs> right? That's, that's just, the, you know, uh, you, you have these kind of crazy right-wing populist uh, movements that are in, whose popularity is increasing. I mean, 74 million people voted for Trump. I mean, that's unbelievable, right? And, 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 and given that that's the world we live in, and given that that's the political world that is the driving force for vaccine refusal and vaccine hesitancy, it's really, really hard to see how we're gonna deal with this problem. Right? We, we just need the world to be different from the way it is. But one thing that I think is absolutely clear, you are not going to deal with this problem simply by um, talking about the facts. Right? That just won't work. Okay, that's it.